encourage you to bring a Bible to a City Church. I'm going to preach uh, most often straight from the text. As many times we make our way through uh, different books and texts of the Bible. And we started Ephesians in uh, 2023 in the fall, and then we'll continue it over the course of these next uh, weeks headed into the spring. Uh, Easter's a little early this year. It's uh, March the 31st, I believe. And so we uh, hopefully will be able to make it through Ephesians by um, Easter time, which will be a good transition into our next series. Um, so how many of you have ever uh, built a house? Not, not necessarily like you did the manual labor, but like you live in a house or built a ho- or have lived in a house that was built for you to live in. Anyone? Okay, several of you. Um, so uh, picture this scene with me. You are building a house and you build the house, you have it exactly like you want it, all the specs and the rooms and the windows where you want them and all those, you know, important things. And then um, you're telling people about this new house that you've built, and you're telling them how awesome it is and how incredible the house is, Uh, and they say, well, what is it like to live there? And you say, well, I don't live there, Um, I just built this house, like it's an awesome house. Let me tell you about the foundational structure, and let me tell you about the windows and the kitchen. The kitchen's amazing. I have an island in the middle, which is my wife's dream. I have an island in the middle of the kitchen. I have all these special features, great bonus room, a place for the kids to play. Well, what's it like to live there? Well, I don't live there. I just have built this house. It's like, well, why don't you live in the house that you built, right? If you build a house to live in exactly like you want it, the joy is building the house. It doesn't, or is living in the house. It doesn't make sense to build an awesome house and then not live everyday life in the house. Or we could illustrate it this way. Uh, We've been involved in the middle of the uh, medical field, right? (laughs) Lots of medicines and diagnosis and treatments and uh, fluids going into mom's body in a lot of different ways. Can you imagine if they uh, spent a lot of time and energy and effort developing some type of medicine that was amazing and made some incredible cure? We'll use cancer as the illustration. That seems to be the topic at hand. Um, they found a cure for cancer, and where it was proven, and uh, it was um, FDA certified. I'm not sure that has as much stock in it as it used to, uh, but FDA certified, all the things that we look for, but they never applied it to anyone. They never gave it to anyone. They never cured anyone's disease or cancer. You would think, well, what's the purpose of it, right? And so we have been in this part of the book of Ephesians. Uh, we are transitioning in Ephesians. We have spent three chapters looking at deep and great theological truths and doctrine in the book of Ephesians. Paul has laid a foundation of who God is and what it means to follow him and be one of his. And then in chapter 4, he makes this huge transition. Uh, We go from doctrine to practice. He spent three chapters laying a foundation, building the house. And what a rich and deep and thought-provoking and meaningful foundation has been laid by Paul. And then in chapter 4, again, remember we included the uh, divisions in the English Bibles. We added the chapters and verses, so this is really just one long letter. But halfway through this letter, Paul transitions. He says, now that I've laid the foundation, let me tell you what it means in everyday life. Let me tell you about the impact that this makes in everyday life. And again and again, he uses this word, walk in the second half of the book, meaning that you're going to walk out what I have laid out in the first three chapters. Um, If you're familiar with, if you can kind of flash back to your English days, I know that's a stretch for a lot of us, but if we can flash back to English class, uh, there was a a, a tense that we were taught uh, that was a command. It was a do an action tense. It's called the imperative. It's a command. Go clean your room. Pick up after yourself. These are commands. It's an imperative tense. In the first half of the book of Ephesians, there is one imperative, one instruction that Paul gives us. In the second half of the book of Ephesians, there are, ready, 40 imperatives telling us how to put into action what he has laid out for us in chapters 1 through 3. And I would encourage you, like, go back and reread 1 through 3 again as we transition into this uh, practical side. Don't do it right now because i got other stuff to say and focus on. But in your own time, uh, go back and read 1 through 3. Uh, Paul is basically saying, now that I have reminded you of who you are, go live like it. 
Look how he starts uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, you know, if you've been in city church, that's a trigger word for us. Therefore means therefore reason. You got to pay attention, right? I, therefore, Paul says, a prisoner for the Lord, strong word here, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Therefore, Paul says, considering the astounding content of chapters 1 through 3, which tells us who God is, what God has done, who we are in Christ. Paul says this is how we are to respond to his grace. Paul says if you get chapters 1 through 3 for us in our English Bibles, if you get everything I've said, if you get 1 through 3, you will walk in a manner worthy of this calling that God has put on your life. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus and a prisoner for Jesus, urges us to live everyday life in a manner, in a way that exhibits the extent and the depth and the significance and the magnitude of God's spiritual rescue of our spiritually dead souls. There's some key words that Paul uses here in this first verse, that word urge. The word urge is an exhortation. It's driven by urgency. We all know what this is. If you're a parent, you know what it is. When you urgent, urgently encourage your child to do something. Um, some of you know I'm uh, Coach Levi's little basketball team. Um, it's basically six, seven, and eight-year-olds. I have to remind myself of that. They're six, seven, and eight. Uh, because we, we love basketball. We grew up kind of in a basketball uh, culture, and so we love basketball. And I love that Levi loves basketball. We watch basketball. He's at the age now. He wants to sit down and watch games with me. And so that's all fun. And then I'm coaching. And so I, I not only love basketball, but I love to win. And so I coach with urgency is a polite word. And so um, <coughs> at times, I have to be reminded uh, they're six, seven, and eight. Um, Tyler's my um, assistant coach on the basketball team that Levi and Noah are on. And Tyler reminded me yesterday that um, they're six, seven, and eight years old. I needed reminding because uh, I was coaching with urgency. Um, rebound the basketball. Play defense. Um, in, in this moment, uh, yesterday, there was urgency because uh, in the last two minutes of the game, it's total chaos. The kids can, um, there's some like regulations before that. You have to play defense in certain zones, all that. The last two minutes, it's just like chaos, like go after the ball and go get it. So in the midst of this urgency, um, poor little Noah was um, right in front of the bench, right in front of me, um, and, and Noah, um, I kind of treat him like Levi. Um, he's at our house enough where I feel like he's almost part of my clan, and so uh, Noah's right there, and there's like three kids trying to guard him. He's trying to dribble through him, and I'm like literally from here to that napkin, and I'm screaming at poor Noah, pick up the ball! Pick it up. Just pick it up and pass it, right? And uh, Tyler's like, Devin, <laughs> seven, right? <laughs> and so that's urgency. Paul's like, I urge you. I urge you. So, and, uh, by the way, if your kid plays for me, I don't yell at all the kids like that. Only, only mine and then those that kind of fit in the mine group, which is Noah in this case, kind of fits in that group. So um, he gets yelled at too. But I... I Hugged him after the game and said, Noah, you know I love you. And I only yelled at you and Levi that way. So he was okay. <laughs> he, he was way less, if you know Noah's personality, he was way less concerned about it than Tyler was, I can tell you. He was like, you yelled at me? <laughs> but um, ur I urge you. I urge you. This is an exhortation driven by urgency. This is Paul, our coach, standing on the sidelines Walk worthily, walk worthily of the calling that God has on your life. And then this word walk, Paul uses it over and over. Walk is how we live. Walk is our life pattern. Walk is what characterizes our everyday. It's our, it's our norm. It's our everyday life. It's walking through Life. And then this word calling, what a big word that is, this high calling of God for every believer that Paul has just spelled out in these first three chapters. And that's why we have to circle back to this gospel calling again and again. 
because we forget. Paul's saying live your life in a way that reflects the magnitude of God's salvation. If God's love is so great, if his rescue is so powerful, if he has granted eternal life to spiritually dead souls, then we should live accordingly. Such a stunning gift of grace comes with great responsibility. Not like in a Spider-Man kind of way, right? Isn't that one of the Spider-Man statements, something like that? But with such an outstanding gift of grace comes great responsibility. So what is a proper response to the beauty of the gospel of grace? Paul starts laying it out for us, verse 2. With all humility, look at these words, and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Immediately, we discover that walking worthy involves both our character and how we interact with others. It's everyday stuff. It's street-level language that Paul uses here. You see, each one of these characteristics, each one of these traits involves self-denial. It involves self-restraint, which goes against our human nature. So let's, let's touch on them briefly. Humility. Humility, basically, in the Bible is considering other people above myself. It is a heart attitude. This same word is sometimes translated in the New Testament as lowliness of mind. In other words, it's the opposite of pride. It's the opposite of a spirit of haughtiness. This word, translated humility, did not even exist prior to New Testament times. Humility was not considered a virtue in the Roman world, but a vice to be avoided. Wrap your mind around that. When Jesus came and lived a life of humility, when the New Testament writers speak about humility in the Roman world that was all about power and dominance and control, humility was a a negative thing. It was a vice to be avoided. And if we're honest, that kind of sounds familiar in our social media-driven culture, doesn't it? Be humble. Perhaps Philippians 2, 5 through 8 is the best commentary on this humble attitude where Paul points us to the example of Jesus. Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he, here's our word, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." It's in Philippians 2 that Paul commentates and points us to the example of Jesus. You want to know what humility looks like? Look at Jesus, who left heaven and humbled himself and became not just a human, a servant. And not just a servant, but a servant that would die on a cross for our sins. That's humility. About this word gentleness. Gentleness is a disposition that resists harshness, that resists insensitivity. Uh, gentleness is being kind, it's being courteous to others. Now, for all of us men, this idea of gentleness is not, listen, to be confused with weakness. I'm not talking about weakness. I'm talking about choosing to avoid harshness and insensitivity. It's more about self-control, that I choose gentleness over getting angry, that I choose gentleness over belittling. That I choose gentleness over condescension, like belittling people, condescending people. That I choose gentleness over humiliating people. One commentator defines gentleness as being angry at the right time and not angry at the wrong time. I love that definition. Isn't that displayed so beautifully in Jesus? Jesus knew when to be angry, didn't he? Like he was angry at times over destruction and violence and sin and the brokenness of the world. It angered his soul. And yet things that we often get angry about, we see Jesus responding with grace and humility and mercy and forgiveness. About this word patience, the early church father, Chrysostom, and, and he defined patience as to have a wide and big soul, to have a wide and big soul. 
the exercise of a large soul that endures annoyances and difficulties. Patience resists immediate self-gratification and indulgence. A word that's often used for patience in the Bible is the word long-suffering. Picture that word. I'm able to suffer long with patience. And then this last phrase, bearing one another in love. This means caring for the interest of others, even when they bother me, even when they annoy me, even when they upset me. It's putting up with each other. Tolerance that is motivated by the will. In this case, love, an act of the will. Humility, gentleness, patience, tolerant love. This is what it looks like to live out our high calling. And in the context of Ephesians, it means specifically in the body of Christ. He's writing to a local gathering, perhaps a collection of house churches, and to live out these things, to live out the doctrinal depth of one through three, Paul says, be a humble person, be gentle, be patient, tolerate each other with love. Uh, Verse 3 speaks to why these traits are so important. Eager, that's a big word that we're eager, we're anticipating it. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This again speaks to why these traits are so important for the body of Christ, that we are eager. Like, what are you eager about? What are you looking forward to, anticipating? Can't wait. Paul says we are eager eager to maintain, and we'll touch on that word in a second, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Part of our high calling is to maintain unity through the Holy Spirit. Now, here's how that flows. The gospel, chapters 1 through 3, the gospel creates unity. We don't create it. The gospel is what creates unity. We'll talk about that when we talk about all the one references in a moment. The gospel creates unity. Our calling, part of our higher calling, is to maintain it. That means we value unity. We keep unity. We invest energy into unity. There's not a part on your body that you created. The body is created with parts, right? My body was created with a right hand. It wasn't my job to create this right hand. You know what it is my job to do? Maintain it. That's why I don't stick it on a hot stove. That's why I don't, if I lived somewhere where it was extremely cold, that's why I wouldn't go and fall asleep with my bare hand in ice, right? It's why I keep all my fingers intact and don't intentionally try to chop them off because I want to maintain what God has given me. I maintain what has been created by someone else. The gospel creates unity, and we have to be intentional, just like I have to be intentional to maintain and take care of the body parts that God has given me. We have to be intentional to maintain unity. Now, these relational traits help determine how we treat each other. Think about it. Without humility, self-interest takes precedence. I only want what's best for me. Without gentleness, we act and react harshly, and we cause hurt and damage. Without patience, we react in anger, and we say things that we can't take back. Without tolerant love, we make people feel unheard, unloved, and invaluable. But enabled by the Holy Spirit, Christian unity is lived out by embracing these Christ-like characteristics which enable and foster healthy relationships not only in the body of Christ, but in our everyday relationships. So circling back to chapters 1 through 3, we are able to live out these gospel traits as we recognize how God treats us. In humility, God the Son takes on human flesh and becomes a servant. The Scriptures describe Jesus as gentle and lowly, patient and merciful. That Jesus lives out these traits perfectly as we fall short. Paul adds in this verse that peace is the bond that unifies us as we live out these gospel traits in our lives. That as the body of Christ, that we should be people of peace. That we should be peacekeepers. That we should be people who strive after peace, not dysfunction and not 
not controversy, not constant judgment, that we should be people who are striving to maintain unity and promote peace as one another people. And it is the indwelling Holy Spirit that enables us to live out these attributes. So verses 4 through 6, Paul draws upon what many believe is a, a creed of the, the early church. Paul says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And so Paul cites this early hymn or creed to emphasize how our oneness is grounded in the triune nature of God himself, that Christianity is a shared faith, that we hold the essentials of our faith together. We are one another people. And you, you hear me talk here at City Church about center circle issues, about closed-handed versus open-handed issues, and it is those center circle issues that hold us together as a Christian family of faith, that we embrace certain things about God and who Jesus is, and those are the things that have historically brought the Christian family together. We are one body. As a matter of fact, let's repeat these things together. Say with me, we are, say one body. We are one body. And we're filled with one spirit. Say one spirit. We are called to one hope. Say one hope. We have one Lord, one, ba- one faith, one baptism into Christ. We are all children of one God. Say one God. This God who is Father over all, through all, in all. Unified, one in Christ, one as God is one. We, as his children, reflect our Father. Now, let me just give you a couple of practical things from this for us as we end today. Um, I, w- I want to say, first of all, that from this text, we're reminded that Christian living is a response to the gospel. Christian living is a response to the gospel. That's why we say our behavior is to be gospel driven based on who he is, what he has done, who we are in him. And so how we interact with each other should reflect an awareness that we are to maintain of who God is and what God has done. It's why we preach the gospel to ourselves daily. It is no mistake that Paul utilizes the metaphor of walking here because walking symbolizes something, doesn't it? It symbolizes Controlled, steady, progressive forwardness, right? Uh, Eugene Peterson, who passed away recently, he was just a profound pastor and writer. Um, he wrote a book about Christian discipleship, and I love this title. His title was A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. I love that phrase. That's what walking with God is. A long obedience in the same direction. We're sprint people, aren't we? We're get it quick, get it fast, make it happen as quickly as possible. What three courses can I take to be a spiritually mature Christian? And that's the opposite of what Paul talks about here. It is a long walk. Now, if you are like me, and I think most of you are, part of the struggle I have in maintaining a consistent and steady walk, hear me, is I have a million-dollar salvation And I have a five-cent response to it. I have a million-dollar salvation of what God has done for me. And I have a five-cent response to it. Because I seem seem a lot of my life way more focused on my phone than I do the redemption that I have in Christ Jesus. And it's why we are often unimpressed by his rescue. And we take it for granted. And this is why Paul spends so much time up front laying the theological groundwork for us so that we lay it, live our everyday lives in response to the gospel of grace. And it is why we want to lean into the gospel again and again and again and never lose sight of it. Christian living is a response to the gospel of grace. And then let me say this last thing. Christian living is also a rejection of self-focus. It's a response to the gospel and at the same time a rejection of self-centeredness, self 
focus. Think about these traits. To have humility, we must reject self-centeredness. I must recognize that life is not about me. Life is bigger than me. Everything I have in life is a gift of grace. Like, how humbling is that? How humbling is that reality that everything I have, the Scripture says, is a gift from a good and gracious heavenly Father. And if I don't recognize in my life, one, what I have, and two, that it is a gift of grace, then I will struggle with humility. You see, it is hard to recognize that every gift that I have is a gift of grace when my eyes are always on the momentary, on what's right in front of me, on the temporary. That's why I encourage us on the regular here at City Church, like get your eyes up off your phone. There's something bigger in life than Instagram. There's something more important than Facebook status. Get your eyes up. And recognize the bigness of the world that we live in. Because it is in seeing the bigness that we respond in humility. Christianity, by nature, is an others-centered faith. And this requires humility, doesn't it? A rejection of self-centeredness. To have gentleness, we must reject harshness. We reject violence. Like gentleness values other people. Gentleness values other people, don't miss this, over being right. Gentleness values other people over proving a point. Gentleness gives space for grace. It reacts contrary to our nature. I am hardwired as a reactionary person. And what I, in my mind, think is not intense is a level 20 of intensity for my kids, my wife, and those that run in my inner circle. In my mind, I'm getting a point across with passion. In their minds, many times, dad is losing it. And there are many times in conversations, particularly as your kids become adults, that you have to step back and say, wait, you thought I was being intense there? Let me show you intense. No, I don't do that. You think I was being intense there? Let me reevaluate how I was coming across, because I sure didn't mean to come across as intensely as I was taken. Is anybody with me on this? People accuse you of being intense, you're like, that was not intensity. But for them, it was intensity. Again, I'm a reactionary person by nature. And so what God is doing in my life is teaching me and growing me to give space for grace and to realize that gentleness is more important than being right and getting my point across. That gentleness moves toward peace and away from callousness and away from cruelty, away from violence. What about patience? To have patience, we must reject our own agenda. We must reject, here's an important one, our own timelines. You see, patience opposes the want it now, expect it now, Amazon mentality that we live in, right? That's our culture. I want it now, I see it now with Amazon, I buy it now, and it's at my house the next day. There were more Amazon packages that arrived at my house in November and December than there are days in those months. How does that happen? That means there's multiple packages arriving at my house every day. That's the culture we live in. I see it now, I want it now, and if I can afford it, or even if I can't afford it, if I've got credit, I'm going to get it now. And patience is the opposite of that. I'm not saying don't buy things on Amazon, because we do. I'm saying that the mentality that drives that pushes against patience. And patience gives space for failing. It gives space for learning. It gives space for growing. 
Patience allows for the waiting game to trust that God is in control. Will I be patient? Rejection of self-focus. To have tolerant love, I must reject another complicated one for us. I must reject my demand for my rights. You see, at times, we must forego our rights to put up with each other. I constantly hear us as Christians using this language. What about my rights? At times, we forego our rights to tolerantly love each other. Don't miss this. Jesus had rights, and he laid them all down for us. He laid them all down for us. Let me be honest. I struggle with humility. I struggle with gentleness. I wrestle with patience. I struggle with exercising tolerant love. Um, I, I struggle in the context of our broader culture for people that irritate me, that don't see things the way I see them, which is the right way in my mind. I struggle. I struggle to keep my mouth closed. I struggle to pray I struggle to allow God to do his work. I struggle. I struggle, listen, in my immediate circle. I struggle in my tightest circle to exercise patience and humility and gentleness and tolerant love. It's why your pastor needs the gospel every single day, to preach the gospel to myself. Now, here's my reality, and maybe I could bring Ash up to speak to this. She may have a different opinion. But I feel like I'm, I'm more humble, and I'm more gentle, and I'm more patient, and I'm more tolerant than I was 10 years ago. I feel like, oh, I got an absolutely. It wasn't from Ashley, but no, it was from her. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm more humble and gentle and patient and tolerant than I was five years ago. It doesn't mean those things don't reoccur. What it means is a long obedience in the same direction, motivated by the beauty of the gospel. Love is a choice. Will we choose it? We choose it by understanding and embracing the depth of God's love for us. By choosing it, we reflect the gospel and promote the unity that God desires for his people, when we understand and embrace the magnitude of his rescue, then we choose humility, gentleness, patience, tolerant love. When we understand and embrace the gospel of grace, unity becomes organic because it flows from gospel living. The way we say it here is the gospel becomes a way of life. How do we live out our faith in this dysfunctional family that we call City Church? We do it by leaning in to the shared belief that by His undeserved grace, God rescued us from sin and death and gifted us with eternal life. We are His people. That's why we are gospel people. And this good news is what unites us. It is what humbles us, and it is why Paul declares at the end of these verses, God is over all. He is sovereign. God is working through us all. He's near, and God is in us all. He has taken up residence in our lives to push us toward the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, I urge me to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. Let's bow our heads for prayer.